Well, good morning, and welcome to our study in a brand new series. We're starting today the book of the Revelation. It's a wonderful book, but it's one that many people shy away from because there's things that they, they see, but they don't quite understand. But as you study the scripture with the scripture, there's many things that will become clear. Now, I've often heard this uh, book referred to as Revelations, plural, but that's incorrect. There's only one revelation, and it's actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the word revelation, it means unveiling or a disclosure. Uh, thus, this book is an unveiling of the character and the program of God in the end times. And now, the book of Revelation is going to center around the visions and symbols of the resurrected Christ, who has the authority to judge the earth, to remake it, and to rule it in righteousness. Now, there's, there's several things that we're going to see here in the first chapter that we want you to pay close attention to because it will set up the rest of the book itself. So thank you for joining me. I hope you're able to join me each and every week, Lord willing, as we study this wonderful, wonderful book. And it starts off, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Now that word soon is a relative term. Because when you talk about soon, when you're talking about eternity, the Bible in Peter says a thousand years is, is like one day. And so even though it's been 2000 years since Christ died and rose again, was ascended into heaven, in God's economy, that was only two days ago. So soon is a relative term, but we believe in the imminent return. The word imminent means it could happen any time. As we understand scripture, everything that is necessary to happen before these events take place is already done, it's already in place, and we are just waiting for God to do what He alone can do, as Jesus told His disciples in Acts chapter 1. It says the Father alone has this in His power. And so God the Father is the one who will call, call the shots. And the time element shortly indicates the, the brevity or the open-ended nature of things. And he says in verse 2, um, he made it known to by sending his angel to a servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the words of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now that's going to be important as we go through this book. Because over and over again, John is only responsible to write down what he sees. He is not called upon to interpret it. He's not called upon to help us understand it. He is simply called upon to write down what he sees. It's an eyewitness account. And as you understand the nature of eternity and, and time, you'll see that God just lifted John out of the realm of time, placed him in eternity. Let me draw it for you just quickly here on the board. You see, if we think of earth on, on this plane, and God, who sits in eternity above it. You'll see that God can see every moment of time from beginning to end in a single glance. That's the eternal nature of God. And by lifting John off this plane of time, he was able to direct his attention to what was going to take place in this period of time, even though he was living here. God can see the end from the beginning. We're going to see that in just a moment as Jesus Christ is described as well. And so he said, this is what you, you see. It says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Now over the years, there's been much discussion as to when the rapture will take place. And some think it will take place at the beginning of the tribulation, some in the middle of the tribulation, some at the end of the tribulation. And of course, they all have their scriptures to support that. Now, my response is a little bit humorous, but very serious as well. And I said, regardless of your opinion as when the rapture will take place, if you're walking across the street and get hit by a, hit by a car, 
Your rapture is right now, regardless of what you believe. The moment of death is going to seal your character and your destiny. And so that's important to keep in mind. But here, as you see, we just saw there was three blessings. Those who read, those who hear, and those who keep the words. Now, James says that if we hear it and don't do it, we're, we're, not, we're deceiving ourselves because we're like a person who looks in the mirror and walks away and forgets what he looks like. <laughs> now, for folks like me, that's a bit of a blessing. But when it comes to the Word of God, there is a blessing for hearing it and doing it. And so there's, this blessing is repeated here in the first chapter of the Revelation. And it says, John, here's the beginning of the letter. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the king, kings of the earth. Now, there's quite a bit that's in these, this little part here. And it says there's grace and grace is God's undeserved activity. Whatever he does in our lives, it's not because we deserve it, it's because he is good and gracious, and it's his grace, his undeserved activity. And it talks about the eternal God, the one who was and is and is to come. Now, remember when Jesus was talking with the Pharisees, he says he was not, he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, but I am the God, because God lives in the eternal now, the eternal present. So as we saw here, he is present at creation. He is present with Adam and Eve. He is present at the time of Christ. He is present at the, the events that in our lives have not yet taken place. Because he, he is eternal and he is above the plane of time in which we live. And so, and then he talks about the seven spirits of God. And he said, but I thought there was only one. Well, there is only one Holy Spirit, but there are seven facets to him, And we read this in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. He's called the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. And again, that reference is Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. And you have all of this before the throne of God. And then you see verses 6 and 7, and from Jesus Christ. We have here a description of him. He, he is this character, is the acts that he has done for us. His death, his resurrection, and all of these things gave John reason to rejoice. You know, it says to him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve God and the Father to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Then he says, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. A wonderful testimony as to what Jesus has already accomplished and will do. Now those words sound very familiar as what the angel said in Acts chapter 1, verse, uh, verses 8 and on, where Jesus says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And then the angel says, why do you men of Galilee stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken away from you into heaven will return in like manner to receive you. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Troubled, you believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. So here we see the scripture interpreting itself and being collaborated by other portions of scripture. And that's why you always want to read scripture in context and you see it in balance with other scriptures as well. And then he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, whenever you see the words the Alpha and the Omega, Alpha is the first letter of the Jewish alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Jewish alphabet. 
It'd be like us saying in our English, I am the A and the Z. And what does that encompass? All the other letters in between. That means everything that can be said or put into a word, that is who I am. I am the Almighty. And he says, I'm the Eternal One. He says, I was, I am, I will be. You get the eternal nature of Jesus Christ and putting himself on the same plane as the Father, which he did while he was on earth as well. He says, I and my Father are one. And so we have that connection through Jesus Christ. And John continues. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patience, patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was exiled there. They didn't like what he had to say, so they just got rid of him. They put him on an island and they exiled him there with no way to get off. He says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which says, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So once again, the command was written, given to John, write down what you see. It didn't say, John, interpret it. It didn't say, John, explain it. He said, John, write it down. So he became God's pen here on earth for us to receive this information. And so as we, we see this uh, playing out, John is now going to be introduced to Jesus as he hears this voice behind him. And he says, write to these churches. Now, as you look at these churches on a map, you will see that as you go from one to the other, it forms a continuous circuit. Now, there's been much uh, question over the years as to whether these churches meant the actual churches that were there, whether they meant uh, the characteristics of churches throughout history, or whether they represented the church ages as the church went through different phases. John doesn't explain it. It is nowhere stated. So we're just going to take it that these letters were written. And if there's something that applies to us where we are today, we need to listen. The whole theology of it is great, but it doesn't help us on our day-to-day -day living. There are seven messages to seven churches with different characteristics, with blessings and things they need to improve on, and we need to hear it, and we need to listen to it as well. So he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among them, the lampstands, was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, John, this was not the first time he had seen this. If you remember, when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, and he was transfigured before them. This is the appearance that he took on. John recognized it as something he had seen before 
and he falls at the feet of Jesus. He recognized the characteristics that had been described earlier as we read in the Gospels. And you'll see over and over in Scripture that John will use words like something like. He's trying to describe what he sees because it's something he's never come upon before. So he has to try to liken it to something that was familiar to them. Now, if uh, we, we do that today, we say, if you're cooking a new, a new dish, says, what does it taste like? Well, it tastes sort of, sort of like this or sort of like that. And so John uses that terminology often in the book of Revelation because how do you accurately describe something you've never seen before? So he says it, it looks something like this. This is how I can write it down to, to understand it. And so how do we see Jesus? We see him with a garment down to his feet. We see a, a golden band around his chest, which was a sign of royalty. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. There's a purity that's there. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Something that could pierce right into your heart. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a fire. So pure, pure. His voice was like the sound of, of many waters. When the Holy Spirit came upon the church in Acts chapter 2, it says, a sound filled the room like a mighty rushing wind. See, when God speaks, there's an atmospheric change that takes place. There's a, there's a dynamic that has come with the voice of God. When he spoke with Moses on top of the mountain, it was like thundering and lightning. It says his, his hand was holding the seven stars, and we'll see what those are. And a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. And what is that? Well, we know that's the word of God. Because in Hebrew, Hebrews it says that uh, the, it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. That's the word of God. And we know that Jesus himself is the word of God, because in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the words of Jesus are like a sword that can cut right through all of our pretense and get right to the heart. When he was dealing with Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus says, you know, I know you're a great teacher come from God. And Jesus says, Nick, you got to be born again. How can I the second time enter my mother's womb? No, Nicodemus, you need to be born physically, but then you need to be born spiritually as well. He could cut right through. And he can do that for us as well. And then as it says his countenance shone like the sun. And so he fell down at his feet as if he was dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. The right hand in Scripture is always the hand of power. And Jesus put his hand on John and says, Don't be afraid. Now I'm told that the words, Do not be afraid or fear not, appear in Scripture 365 or so times. That means there's one for every day of the year. In Timothy, the word says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And so don't be afraid. Believe, have faith, and trust in Jesus. He says, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So here we have the eternal nature once again of Jesus Christ. I am the first and the last and everything in between. I was dead, but now I'm alive forever. <laughs> the Bible says it's appointed unto man to die once. And after that comes the judgment. Well, we are looking forward 
to the time we can meet him because when we've died spiritually to ourselves and we become spiritually alive to Christ. The Bible says we are a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things become new. And then again, write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. All right, so I want to pause here for just a moment because we have three areas that John is going to be writing on. He's going to be writing on, number one, what he saw. That's past. What now is, that's the present. And thirdly, what will be. Future. So there's three tenses that John is going to be writing about. All right, he's already talked about the past, where he talked about Jesus Christ dying. He talked about all of that taking place, rising from the dead. So that was the past. He's writing about the present because this is happening to him right now. And the letters to the seven churches are going to be right now and going on. And then he's going to write about what will be. And that's what the bulk of the book of the Revelation is about to be revealed. What will be. And we'll come to that when we're at the right chapter. But as we finish off this chapter... He says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands is this. See, Jesus is going to explain it, not John. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Hmm. So there's no speculation about that. Jesus makes it known what it's going to be. And he is well able to do that. Remember, in the first picture we had up, God sits above the whole span of human history. And that's why he is able to see where we are today, you and me, and he's able to plot our pathway for each day. And we trust him. You can trust him with your life, with eternity. This is going to be an exciting study. And I hope that you're able to join us each week. Pray with me. Dear Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity we have to unwrap the Word of God. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would give our minds clarity and understanding. I pray that you would help us to, to receive what is being said. And instead of fear, which many people have when they come to the Revelation, that we would see it through the eyes of faith and through the confidence we have in the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. So, Lord, for all of these things, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you, folks. And thank you for being with us as we launch this brand new study. So, Lord willing, next week we'll take a look at chapter 2 as we launch into the messages to the seven churches. That'll be over the next two weeks as it takes chapters two and three. So until then, may God richly bless you.